Robert Hooke, as you'll see, is a kind of a remarkable figure in the history of uh, English science, partly because he's not that all well known and in a certain kind of history, he's been ignored. And we'll get back to that ignoring of his history in the lecture after this one next week. But for the moment, what I wanna do is emphasize something that he did relatively early in his life that has had major effects in the history of microscopy. So we wanna do that first, and then we'll get a little more into the depths of the complexity of this man. So for many years, this pair of bits of information, this plaque, which was in, in Oxford, and notice it points something out about 1655 to 1668. This plaque was, almost all that one could find about, about Robert Hooke and maybe a picture like this of the apparatus that he worked on with Robert Boyle. So Robert Boyle became an important part of this. I may have men I mentioned him in the last lecture. So what Hooke had done, let me now switch to a little bit of history. This is his life history. We'll do another list at the end that goes through something about his major achievements. But this is sort of the history that, that maybe matters. And there's this wonderful portrait. It is not clear that this portrait is actually Robert Hooke, uh, but there's a pretty good guess for it that it is. And we'll explain that again later on. I'm keeping all of these little threads in suspension for a while because I want to get eventually to the uh, critical issue for microscopy. So his life, he was born, it was a sort of an interesting story. There's a lot of literature about his background. His early life is not at all clear, except it was thought that he was pretty sickly. So he was ed educated at home by a minister, his father, a minister. And then his father died. And the story is he then went to London with 30 pounds in his pocket. I mean, some small amount of money. But by that time, he had already showed that he had an extraordinary ability as, a, uh, as an artist. He was, a very, he was known to be very good as, a, as an artist. And so he was a print, apprenticed to a painter named Peter Lely, who was one of the famous painters of the time. He also turned out to be mechanically very adept. And so the rumors are that he took a clock of, a car apart and rebuilt it out of wood so that it, and it worked. So imagine the kind of skill that it takes to make anything out of that by carving it, making it, making it go. So he had this kind of skill and Eventually what happened was the, he realized that his work with Peter Lely wasn't getting him where he wanted to go. And he ended up at Oxford. There's again a little mystery about how this man from relatively poor background ended up at Oxford, but Oxford was just starting up as a major institution at that point. It turned out he was also something of a musician. And so he got a job at Oxford playing the organ. At least this is the story I've been able to dig up. And as well, join the chorus. These are all sort of small minor issues. Most importantly, while he was at Oxford, he met Christopher Wren, he met Robert Boyle, and they became a kind of a group of budding young scientists. Boyle was a man who had a lot of resources. And so eventually he became the assistant to Robert Boyle. This all took place, you know, you see in a few years. At this point, what was he? About 20 years old when he joined Robert Ball, uh, Boyle. By 1660, his reputation with Boyle was pretty, pretty impressive already. 
1660, you may remember, was about the time that the Royal Society was founded and Boyle was brought in as one of the early members of the Royal Society. Boyle recommended that Robert Hooke then become the curator of experiments. And what that job meant was that at every meeting of the society, which Hooke was responsible for bringing in something new and exciting, a new, ex a new discovery, a new thing that he had looked at, Turned out he had been playing around with things like capillary action. He had been interested in uh, astronomy. And so he had observations on uh, stars and on planets. You'll see in, in a little bit that, for instance, one of the things that he did was he was the one who first observed the red spot on Jupiter. And not only did he observe it, which is interesting, but he used the fact that the red spot moved as he looked at it from day to day to determine what the rotation period was of the planet Jupiter. Okay, you have to remember this is uh, sort of 50 years after Galileo's work became clear. So this is all happening in this wonderful kind of time. So he started out as the curator, it turns out this was not only a paid position for him, but it was the first time that a scientist got a job being paid for it. I mean, it's one of those things you don't think about anymore. He became a fellow of the Royal Society. And during this, he and, and Christopher Wren started using the microscopes. And I'll talk a little about more of the type of microscope it was. And Wren, who apparently had pretty good connections up in the upper reaches of society, showed some of the work that they had been doing, some pictures that they had drawn, mostly of insects, to the king. And the king said to Wren, why don't you put all this stuff together in a book? And Wren said, no, I don't have the time, but there is this guy, Robert Hooke, who can do this work. And so what eventually emerged from that is this book, which is what I'm going to spend some time on now, called Micrographia. And Micrographia, as you'll see, is, is quite an extraordinary document. It was, in a sense, the first, I'm going to say it in a funny way. It was like the first National Geographic in London. I mean, it was a picture book, a book of extraordinary observations and extraordinary illustrations. And it woke up a whole population of people's interests in looking at things with the microscope. And so it, it became a bestseller in a certain way. And and is thought still to be one of the landmarks in the, the scientific uh, explosion that happened in this period of time in the 17th century. Later, almost right after the book was published, there were two major events that then happened in London. One of them was the bubonic plague and you'll see there's a, an influence of that in the, um, in the book. And then soon after, there was this enormous fire that flattened three quarters of the city in London. And so it then turned out that among other skills that Hook had, he and Christopher Wren were both appointed surveyors of the damage and were given the responsibility eventually of rebuilding the city. Christopher Wren is famous for having built about 50 churches. But what's not quite so well attributed is the contribution of Robert Hooke to this, except he was known as the guy that laid out the plots for all the buildings that had been destroyed. He was the surveyor that figured out what buildings went where and was involved in construction of new stuff. So he's a very interesting man in a lot of ways.
What I want to do, though, is concentrate first on this book called Micrographia. And the interesting thing about Micrographia is that uh, it includes this sort of random assortment of things. And what I want to do is show you that you yourselves, what a way to put it, we can all look at a digitized version of this book through the Royal Society. What I've got in these panels here is a little bit of a sense of how this digitization works. So here's what happens when you click on that link to see the book of Micrographia. The way it's set up, this is a digitized version. And the simple part of it is that you can click on a page and the book opens. Okay, this is very clever, right? It doesn't make noise, unfortunately. It would be fun if it went with each turn of the pages. But as you go, now you begin to see the opening of this book. There's an interesting feature. In order to have the Royal Society publish it, Hook made a deal that they would be willing not only to publish this thing, but to give him free reign to talk about anything he wanted to. And it says so somewhere in here, and you'll be able to read this material if you, if you like. I'll show you that in a minute. But I want to point out that here it is dedicated to the king, because it was the king that supported the Royal Society and this enterprise. So what, how does this work? Well, in this display system, there's a, a hand here. If you click on this hand, it gives you what is for the moment the most important thing, what they call an index view. And what it does is it allows you now to look as you go page by page, you can go page by page through this entire book and sort of then pick a specific page and open it up and look at it. This is really quite an impressive collection of material. So let me start, for instance, by going back to the beginning. Well, look at the size of the preface. In the preface, which is quite a document, um, Hook really starts to talk about his philosophy of science and what you can see as you start thinking about doing experiments to learn about things. Remember that the whole idea at this time was to push the idea from Bacon of the value of experimental experience and direct experience by yourself, okay? So another feature of this is that now when I click on this page, I get to see this. And two things are interesting. One of them, fascinating in a way, is that the original pages are digitized in this form so that if I now, when I understand that there is something folded in on this, if I click over here, it unfolds it, which is kind of amazing. And so what you can see here is a set of pictures that is part of the first pictures in the, in the book, in which what's present in this region, of course, is the, the famous picture of his microscope, okay? Um, and I've pointed out last time, I think, that the idea of this microscope was that it had two lenses, but also it had this very elaborate illumination system, okay? As soon as I go to it, it closes up. The other feature that's here, just so that you know it's there, is that if I click on this box, I'll see a translation of what he has to say here, okay? So the discussion about the microscopes themselves is in the preface. The first thing he talks about in the book is 
and I, I just love this thing, of the point of a very sharp, small needle, where he starts out by saying, you know, in geometry, the, the simplest thing to talk about is a mathematical point. So let's try this with observations. And he goes through and explains that he goes into it in quite a bit of detail. We are not going to go through that right now, but the next page in the book is the plate with those descriptions in it. And what I have is both his text here and also the, uh, the pictures themselves that form this plate. His point is, if I can make a terrible pun, his point is that the point of a needle that you can see here is certainly far from the ideal smooth cone that you might expect it to be. And then he looks at a dot on a piece of paper. So he looks at a dot on a piece of paper that was made with a pen. And he says, look at how the material has spread out, that it's not a single point at all, but that it seems to be much more diffuse. And he, what he's really doing is arguing for the use of the microscope as a way of understanding things in more detail. And then he goes from a point to a line, which he says, which he shows here is, is the edge of a razor. Okay, that's been carefully honed to be as smooth as possible and still quite a bit uneven. So it's not a bad beginning, but as you saw, this book is really quite elaborate. It has 50 some odd separate images on plates, separate plates of image in there. And so what he did was he looked at what he could and there's a wonderful story. There are a couple of them, which I'll feed into your amusement and interest. This has to do with the way he wrote up his description of how he did his work, trying to take, create these images of, in this case, it will be an ant. And so here, here's what he has to say. If you can imagine trying to do this work yourself, remembering there are no photographs there's no camera at this point. There's no way to sort of quickly capture an image. What he had to do to create the images when you're going to see them in a minute was go through a process like this. So here's what he says. I'll read it sort of briefly, but I'll read it. He says, this was a creature more troublesome to be drawn than any of the rest, for I couldn't think of a way to make it be quiet in a natural posture. While it was alive, if its feet were even glued in wax or put into something, it would so twist and wind its body that I couldn't see any way to get a good view of it. And if I killed it, its body was so little that I often spoiled the shape of it before I could really view it. So this is the nature of these minute bodies that as soon almost as their life is destroyed, their parts immediately shrivel and lose their beauty. Oh, what do you do? So what he finally decided, I took the creature and put it into a drop of very well rectified, which means distilled, spirit of wine. This I found would presently dispatch as it were the animal and being taken out of it and laid on a paper, the spirit of wine would evaporate leave the animal dry in its natural position, at least in a way that it could be then pinned or do something that you could draw. However, he says, I gave it a bit of brandy or wine, which knocked them down dead drunk, so that they became moveless. Though at first he struggled for a little while and, and then finally it stopped moving. And then after an hour, it got up and walked away. So here's where he says, and then out of a sudden, as if it had been awakened out of a drunken sleep, it suddenly revived and ran away. Being caught and treated again the same way, he remained moveless for a good while, but again recovering. 
and he was a den redip and suffered to lie for some hours in the, uh, in the alcohol. And after it had been there and dried out for another three or four hours, it again recovered life and motion. So he really had to work to get this image together. Well, this is the image that he got. Okay, this is the, uh, the famous picture of the drunken ant. And we could see it in the book as well, but I thought it was kind of easier to just go this way for it. Kind of amazing stuff. So then he continues to look at various things. To a certain extent, he was doing this, this is a process that took several years and people were constantly bringing him things to look at. And so the book has things like the edges of various plants, the leaves of plants. He has some of his own interests, which have to do, for instance, with uh, what happens when you have sparks that fly out of a flint. What do they look like? What do the sparks themselves look like? He found, as you'll, well, I won't go into it now, but he looked at fossils and shells and started to ask, wait a minute, these shells came from the top of these cliffs. How did they get there? And he started to develop a theory about changes in the earth, which again, we'll get to later, okay? So here's another one. This is the flea. Now, clearly it was known that the flea was the insect or a non-insect, this <laughs> creature, that uh, was probably responsible for the plague that eventually took over London, okay? It was the flea that, that uh, spread the disease through biting on animals like mice, okay? But he looked at this organ, organism, the flea, and really thought it was extraordinary. In, in an almost an aesthetic way, we'll get a little bit further into why this aesthetics is, is so important for him. But what he says, the strength and beauty of this small creature, had it no other relation at all to man, would deserve a description. And so he gets very involved in this curious contrivance of its legs and joints, because he can see he's never seen anything like it. But what you can do is it can fold them short within each other and then suddenly stretch and bring them back out to their whole length. So that at the end, he says, you can get all these legs clinched up together so that when it leaps, springs them all out and exerts its whole strength at once. Well, this is the image that he generated of the flea. And it's a classic, almost as artwork, as much as in biology, but it's a remarkably detailed image, this, uh, this flea. I've read a paper recently in which some people tried to duplicate this work and they find that nowadays it's very hard to find a flea to do the work on, which is sort of funny, right? That we've done such a good job of eliminating fleas from the environment. You know, you treat dogs so that they no longer have fleas on them and all the rest. It's really quite, uh, quite an amusing story that if you wanted to duplicate this work, it would be pretty hard to do. And once again, this is one that shows up in the book. And just to show you how one can do this sort of thing, you go to the index and I look for the picture of the flea. which maybe I'll find easily. By the way, this is just on the side. This is some frozen material just for a quick look at it. Um, one of the things that's frozen, I'm not gonna go through it, is his own urine. He's a very direct observer of things, okay? But let's see if I can go a little further down and find the image of the flea. 
somewhere here. You can see there's a lot of material in here. Come on. There's the ant on the right. Here it is. And once again, this book was published in this sort of standard book size, but the images, the plates, were all set up so that they could be folded inside. So here's this diagram on the left of the stack lets you see the unfolded image. And then I can go here and click on the move button and drag this whole thing over, you see? So what it must be like to have opened a book like this and then unfolded these pictures must have been quite an extraordinary experience for the first time that it was done. Okay, let me now go back to my own narration of this. Okay, so that's the flea. Next is a louse, okay? This is interesting, you'll see in a couple of ways. First of all, he's less impressed by the, the beauty of this organism. This is a creature so officious that will be known to everyone. Officious means sort of popular, I think, that it will be known to everyone so busy and so impudent that it will be intruding itself in everyone's company. These are the lice that end up on the hairs, right? Anyone that has a young child that goes to school these days has a problem often with kids coming home with lice. But anyway, he says, this is such an, an ambitious uh, insect that it fears not to trample on the best. It affects nothing so much as a crown. It feeds and lives very high. And that makes it so saucy, this is his word, as to pull anyone by the ears that comes in its way. It will never be quiet until it has drawn blood. It's troubled not so much as a man that scratches his head as knowing that the man is contriving some mischief against it. Well, so he's trying to look at this thing and what he does is he says, I found letting one creep on my hand that it immediately fell to sucking and he's been watching it eat his own blood. And he says, I could plainly perceive a small current of blood which came directly from its snout, passed into its belly. And then there seemed to be some sort of contrivance like a pump or a pair of bellows or a heart for very swift systole and diastole, diastole, the blood seemed drawn from its nose and forced into the body. So what does this beast end up looking like in his diagrams? I'll go back to the book because this is one where you really want to see it. And it turns out there's another listing here, an index and um, observation 54 is of a louse, okay? And so now I can click on the page and we can sort of see that there's an image there. And now I will go and close this and open this. <gasps> Imagine opening this up the first time you read this book to be astounded by this, this kind of structure. Well, let's go back and look at it for a second. So now I've taken that picture mounted it in the notes this way. It's much less impressive this way, but it's the same basic structure, right? And now you can see some of what he had in mind in terms of uh, the internal structure where you could actually sort of look at the idea of how the blood went from the snout of this thing or the opening, this little opening book all the way through and into the insides of the organism. So once again, this is the sort of stuff that, that has always impressed people as it should. But now 
just for the fun of it, I opened a, a book of modern microscopy where somebody had posted this, which is a scanning electron micrograph of a louse itself, obviously posed to look pretty much like the one that Hooke described 300 years earlier. Okay, 350 years earlier. Look at the differences between this and that, which really sort of amazed me. The last thing that I want to discuss that's in my cross micrographia is this. And this is the one that you read about in textbooks of biology. And in many ways, it's a kind of a, it's really the least important thing that was in this book, except for people that are looking backwards to think about it. And what he said is that he took a piece of cork and cut a thin piece and then realized that he had to make it even thinner, an exceeding thin piece, because he wanted to look through it. And then he talks about how it was hard to see that what he had to do was put it on a black plate of some sort and shine a light on it from an angle. And then, only then, was he able to see that it had this structure that was sort of like a, a honeycomb. So he can say that in this sort of region, he can see that it has a honeycomb and it depends a great deal which way you make the cut as to what you actually see. So that in, if you cut it in one orientation, you see these things as little squares or boxes. But in fact, as you see that they're actually cylindrical and you can see them this way as cylinders. Now, he describes these things as being, let's see if I can find it, they're sort of cellular, they're cells. He uses the term cells in this discussion. I'm not sure if it's in this little part. Yeah, and the cells and pores, okay? And so this is thought to be, at least historically, the first use of the term cell for something in biology. Now, a number of books, a number of references, and I have sucked into them, seem to imply that somewhere in, the, in here, he describes these as being like amongst cells. I've looked through a lot of the literature or a lot of his writings on this, and I don't see it. What he was interested in, though, was the idea that these could be channels for the movement of liquid in the plant. And I'm not going to go through the, you can read the descriptions of it if you go back to the paper. So this is the, the sort of essence of this book, Micrographia, that there's a, a famous British diarist named Samuel Pepys. He is, he's known because he was a diarist who provided a daily portrait of what life was like in London for, at least for him. A great deal of what he did was he found women to sleep with. And that's in the book, so that makes it more popular. But he also describes having gotten this book and stayed up all night reading it. And so it's, it's the sort of thing that, that is part of the both literature and the mythology about micrographia, except that it was that popular and it was spread throughout Europe. It was well known. So now let me get back to what happened to Hook for the rest of his life. And, and this is a list of some of the things that he had been involved with, okay? Um, there was a problem with Robert Hooke, which is that his mind was constantly churning on things and constantly coming up with ideas and not always being so firm about following them up. So there are some tricky issues which we'll discover, discuss 
in the in the next lecture on on his battles with various other scientists uh, during the 17th century. But these are the sorts of things that he thought about. So his first written document was this paper on capillary action. But he was already starting to think about this issue of a longitude clock. Now, the subject of longitude, I think I mentioned last lecture, was a very important thing for a country that was involved in seafaring. Because once you got out of sight of land, it's pretty hard to know where you were. And you could judge something by the height of the stars, but you could judge where you were in terms of the latitude by the angle at which stars appeared above the, the horizon. But you couldn't figure out where you are along the Earth until you had some idea of what time it was. Then you might be able to say, well, I know the sun rose at, or the stars rose at this moment, and it took half of a day or half of a night for them to go directly overhead. And if I know what time it is now, I have some idea of where I am in that pathway. And so there was a great deal of interest. As I mentioned, there's a book called Longitude about the solution of this problem. But he was clearly one of the people involved with that. He had gotten involved from Galileo's work and from others with the idea first that one could have a pendulum that could use, be used to set time. However, when you, you have a, a, a pendulum swinging and you're on a boat that's swinging itself, this thing is not gonna be very accurate. And one of Hooke's long-time interests had to do with springs. And one of his idea then was to take springs and make sort of a, a spiral spring like this that could wind and unwind and use that to control the mechanism of a clock. Now he discussed it with some of his his colleagues, he actually designed one and showed it to Wren and to some of the other Royal Society people. They said, hey, publish this. And he said, well, not yet. I don't quite have that stuff all together. So it remained a subject of discussion rather than a printed document, which as you'll see, became a problem later on. He also, as I mentioned, was an astronomer. He saw the great spot on Jupiter. He also, in some of his work, needed to have some way of defining temperatures. And so he was one of the people that designed, defined the freezing point of water as a zero. We know that now as the centigrade scale, right? He played around with the what was necessary to keep animals alive. And so he showed that you could, even if you more or less uh, inactivated a dog, if you simply pumped air into the lungs, you could keep it alive. He looked at comets working with Christopher Wren, and that will come back in another minute or two. He established the rotation period of Mars, which is a lot harder than Jupiter. And he started thinking about planetary motion and what is it that keeps planets in, in movement. And one of, the, one of the things that he came up with is the postulate that it is not that things are sort of held around the edges, but that in fact, what's moving is what we now call centripetal forces that if you have an object which is a planet or an, any object, that there's a force that comes from that pan, planet driving things towards it. And the fact that it is then moving horizontally is what keeps it going, not off to the world, but around into a circle. That was his early thought about this thing. In other words, that there was this force, and you'll hear later on that it was 
dominated by Isaac Newton, but he had clearly made some effort to think about this process earlier. And so he talked about the, the planetary motion. All of this is going on, look at this thing, within a few year period, right? So remember that in the middle of all of this was first the plague on London and then the fire of London. And after the fire, as I mentioned, it was clear that both he and Christopher Wren, along with some others, had the skills in the background to start working on the rebuilding of churches and the rest of the buildings in, in London. There's an interesting side issue. There are many side issues. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but the claim is that there were basically no people killed by the fire of London, even though the city was flattened, huge amount flattened. I think the way this is now being interpreted is that there were no people of significance lost in the fire. Not a terrible way to think about it. All of the rich people, if you will, the classic people had left London because of the plague just as with the current plague, people that can afford to go out into the country, countryside. This was very clear there. So it may very well be that there were not a lot of the sort of the governing and the royal class of people in London during the fire, but the other people didn't count and weren't counted. Another little bit of a social comment that you might wanna throw about. At any rate, he worked with Wren both on this business of laying out the city and working out the design. And then he and Wren worked together to put together something that would be a monument to the Great Fire. We'll talk about the monument at, at the end of this talk. Because among the other things that he did, he then gave a lecture on trying to show the movement of the earth around the sun. I mean, it was, it was sort of clear that that might be the case from Galileo's work and Copernicus's thinking. But the question is, what was that path? And the idea was that the path was an ellipse, but why would it be an ellipse and how would one come about that? That became a major source of discussions between him and Isaac Newton, who actually solved most of it pretty well. But in doing this, he was involved in designing an, uh, an astronomical observatory in Greenwich, which is now the place that people talk about as Greenwich Mean Time. That's the, the sort of central spot for measuring time on Earth. And he was one, again, he and presumably Christopher Wren worked on the design of that observatory. It's not in this list, but he also uh, designed a hospital, which uh, is uh, the, the Hospital for the Insane, which is now thought of as Bedlam, is the name of the hospital that he designed uh, for. Uh, as a major structure. He designed several other large buildings, but most of them, he was kind of an assistant to the design rather than the person whose name goes on it as the, uh, as the formal observatory. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, and he's busily trying to control the way the city is being put together. <clears throat> He's still working with the Royal Society and very much interested in the kinds of things that are going on. And so one of the things he was sort of assigned to do was to see what could be done in terms of those observations, which we'll talk about next week, that von Leeuwenhoek had done 
in which he talked, first of all, about the observations of microorganisms, and then this extraordinary observation of sperm from ejaculates from his own material, which we'll get to then later on. And he then got involved, as I said, with some of these discussions with Newton about the laws controlling, controlling celestial mechanics. Again, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But towards the end of his life, he got interested in yet a few other things. He started, as you saw early on in, in micrographia, he had observed something about fossils and showed that fossils really looked as if they were in some way plant material that had been converted into stone and that it really represented early forms of plants. And he was able to say, and he did publish this, that it's possible that there are plants that existed a long time ago that no longer exist. And that some of the new, the plants that we know now had arisen more recently. Uh, do I hear echoes of Darwin in this thing? This is again, 200 years earlier. It's kind of amazing thinking. And then he met a man by the name of Knox, K-N-O-X, who had been a traveler and they became friends and Knox filled him with interesting tidbits about his, meaning Knox's travel into the, uh, the East, into the Indies. When he finally came back, he talked about a, a plant product. It was given the name of Ganges, as it turns out, something like that, which turns out to be cannabis. And he gave a lecture, Hook did, on the uses and effects of cannabis and the mind altering and the mind soothing capabilities of this material. So this is an extraordinary life of a man whose interests seem to go all over the place. And I wanna finish with some thoughts about this monument, the monument to the great fire. Here's what it looks like. If you go to its location in London, what you see is this rather large structure. It's about 20 stories high. So in early London, this must have really towered over things, okay? So it's a huge structure. It took them five years to design and to build it. And there's quite a discussion in the tourist literature of who, who built this thing. And if you go from one page, looking up the monument of London, and you look it up from one page after another, mostly it says it was designed by Christopher Wren. It now turns out that most of this work was probably done by Robert Hooke, but working with Wren one way or another. Anyway, here's the interesting thing about this monument. It's the monument to the Great Fire of London. And it's, you know, a historical kind of thing for people to remember. Inside is this elaborate spiral staircase that gets you all the way to the top. And you can actually, you can see the little people here. You can actually come out on top if you're willing to climb. This is, depending on who does the counting, something like 300. 50 steps going all the way up. And there are little niches as you go along that sort of lean out over the central region. And if you look up through it under the right circumstances, you can actually look through the tunnel and it turns out that at the very top, this thing opens up. I can't show you in direct, a direct diagram, but it looks like this. If this is that globular structure that sits on the top of the, of the column, there's apparently a pair of trapdoors located right here. 
and you can flip them open and see from the very bottom of this structure, you can actually see all the way through straight up. Well, that's cute. Well, it turns out, and this was a discovery made by a woman by the name of Lisa Jardine, who did a big biography, both of Wren and of Hooke. She wrote a couple of these things at the, in the 2003-2004 period. She describes going into this building for a tour because she was writing about it. And the, uh, the guardian of the building said, by the way, have you seen the basement? What? Who knew there was a basement? And according to her story, he pulled back his chair, he lifted the rug that was on the floor, and there was a trap door that led down to the basement of this structure. So the way at the bottom of this, somewhere down where we can't see it, was a room. And that room had been designed, it was pretty clear, to be a laboratory. And it may very well be that this view that you're seeing in this picture here is actually a view from inside the basement. Okay. And when you then go back and look at the exchanges of letters between Hook and Wren about this structure, it becomes very clear that they deliberately designed this structure to be used for a couple of purposes, one of which was to work with falling bodies, to drop things down this tube and see whether they would curve as they went down, to see if you could figure out any evidence of the motion of the earth as things fell. fell. That was one of the ideas. So this was, in fact, a physical laboratory, an experimental machine. The other was, this was designed to point directly at the zenith of the sky, something that was called a, a zenith telescope. And the idea of it, I'll spell out the term here. Because if you look at any British discussions of it, if you find any, it's called a zenith telescope. But the idea was that if you could focus a telescope on a spot of sky at sufficiently great distance, then as the Earth moved in its orbit, the position of that one star you were looking at would change with respect to the other stars as, as things about the other stars would the, as the, the earth moved. And you could use that again as a way of figuring out something about the path of the earth around the sun. As it turns out, it doesn't work very well because you need more precision that you can get out of this structure. And apparently there's a little too much vibration uh, so that you couldn't focus it quite as sharply as one would like because there's traffic outside, even 17th century carts moving by. Okay, but to, the reason I'm including this is to give you a sense of the breadth of interest that was going on at that time in English society or in English science. This is all part of the, the story that gets put together about Robert Hooke Christopher Wren then turns out to be quite important in these things, although not in terms of his reputation. He's known specifically as an architect, whereas Robert Hooke is known through many of these different approaches, many of which were the physics that came out of his original ideas working with uh, Boyle. And then I've heard the discussion that says, you know what he was really trying to do in micrographia, in the microscope book, was to look 
for the particles that Descartes had said was the basis of all of life or all of structure. And of course, they're much too small to see. But that may have been part of the motivating force that drove people to use microscopes in general. And we'll then have to talk about this some more later on, I think.